Okay, welcome back to class, everybody. It's a pretty good time to get started. So uh, let's just briefly review what we talked about last time. So last time in class, we spent a good chunk of class uh, at the beginning just answering your questions on homework four. Uh, then we looked at how to switch solvers in Pyomo, and we saw that Pyomo does a significant amount of work to make that really easy for us because we could use the exact same code uh, and just by editing one line, very quickly change from one silver to another, even though those solvers are fundamentally different programs and communicate in different ways with Pyomo, for example. Uh, and then uh, we spent some time programming facility location, but we didn't get all the way through it. So we got just up to right about uh, defining the objective function. And we're going to pick that up later today. So the plan for today is to begin uh, by answering any remaining questions that any of you might have on homework four. So that's due next Tuesday. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, one of your final opportunities to ask questions on that homework before you have to turn it in. Uh, and because that's due next Tuesday, I'd like to spend some time to introduce homework five. Uh, so uh, we're just going to talk about what that homework is. And for those of you that are already done with homework four, it'll give you a chance to uh, get a head start on homework five over the weekend if that's what you want to do. Uh, and then we're going to finish facility location uh, and do s a couple of variants uh, on it along the way. And uh, after we're done with that, we're going to look at programming an integer program for a minimum spanning tree, which is going to be significantly different than the other uh, examples that we've done because we're going to have to iteratively add constraints to the program. So uh, we're not going to have the whole program written ahead of time. Uh, we're going to solve it, add some constraints, solve it, add some constraints, and so forth. Uh, so that's the basic plan for today. Uh, before we get into your questions from homework four, I want to highlight a couple of things. So uh, I just uh, put up an announcement on Canvas. You may have received it as an email with a tentative presentation schedule for the presentations towards the end of the semester. So uh, all of you should know when your group is going. Uh, because of the annual INFORMS conference, which is the main OR conference during the year, and lots of the ORIE faculty are going to be gone. I'm going to be gone. Lots of your classmates are going to be gone. Because of that, we have to have two makeup sessions that are on a Friday and on a Monday. I scheduled the rooms for those. The times are uh, also on that email. So definitely the groups that are presenting those days, uh, I hope that you can make it. But moreover, I hope that all of you can make it. And one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, ask you to write some feedback for a randomly selected uh, set of groups. So each of you is going to have to write some feedback for probably two or three groups that are presenting. And that's going to make sure that the audience is paying attention to the presenters and is present throughout the uh, entire set of presentations. Okay. So uh, any questions about presentations or that email uh, or when your group is going and so forth? If not, the other thing I'd like to ask you is if you could please email me a short title for your project. So something that's just three or four words. Uh, and that's what I'll use to uh, sort of update the schedule and post your projects online and so forth. OK. Uh, so that's the uh, main administrative thing to talk about today. So the next thing is uh, any remaining questions on homework four? Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So K means a significantly worse classifier than uh, the multinomial logistic. And when you say you look at the images, uh, I assume that you're you're looking at the final Ws that That's you're right, getting, yeah. right? So the final Ws for uh, the K means classifier, what do those look like? They are just, they are just red. Just red. Well, they're just red, for one thing. But the, the other thing is, and somebody, I think uh, maybe Dan mentioned this a while ago, that actually the optimal Ws there are just averages of right. uh, a bunch of images, yeah. right? So the optimal W for the threes is just going to look like a fuzzy three because it's just uh, taking the averages of a bunch of threes, right? right? Uh, the optimal W for 4 is going to look like a fuzzy 4. But what what should the optimal Ws look like 
for the multinomial logistics. So in this one, uh, pixels that appear in a lot of fours but not in the other uh, numbers, they're going to get a high value for the W. And pixels that appear in the others but not in the four are going to get a low value, right? right? And this was just a single gradient step. Right. But when you're doing many, many of these, you're going to be, in a sense, kind of averaging these gradient steps because we're always taking a step in the negative gradient direction, right? So in the end, you might get some things that look like a blob over right. here, like a blob over here. Right. But it's, what it's ultimately identifying is the pixels that tend to be in fours but not in others. Okay. That's right. And so they're not they're not going to necessarily look like a fuzzy four or like a fuzzy three, like the K means classifier. Uh, and, and you mentioned that you wanted our MNIST code to output plots of our solution. I guess that's just a solution for each of the digits. Yeah, I think that would be nice. And the reason that I asked for that is that when doing any kind of optimization problem like this, it's really really useful to look at your solution and to see if it actually is making sense, right? Because you, by now you realize that you're writing incredibly complicated programs, right? It's very, very easy to have a bug somewhere in the program. And uh, a great way of checking whether you do have a bug or not is to be checking whether your solutions actually make sense in terms of your understanding of what's going on. Yeah. Yep. And so then it calls that function and picks the timing for it. It has been harder to put that into our main... Okay, so, uh, and I think that your question comes out of outputting a line like this, the train right. and test time is yep. this. Yep. So the time module does something slightly different, which is it'll run something many times and kind of take an average over the number of times that you're running it, or take the maximum or something like that. All I've done here is I use the time module, which gives you uh, like the timestamp. And I record the timestamp before I do my training and testing. And I record the timestamp after I do my training and testing. Right. Uh, and then I just uh, print out the difference between those timestamps, which tells me how many seconds pass. So I'm not using time it in the, in the way that you're using it. I'm using timestamps that just give me, that's right. So I record the start timestamp. I do the code that I'm executing, I record the end timestamp, and then print out the difference. Okay. So, and you wouldn't include the plotting in that? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, I definitely Sorry. don't include the plotting in that. Yeah. But I do include the testing. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions? Yeah. Uh, I just want to double check that in parallel section. Uh, first, uh, you equally divide, uh, distribute equally the that's right. So th that's what I did. That's what I did. And the reason that I did that is because on my my laptop has four cores in it. So if your laptop has two cores, it's probably better to split it in two. And my code actually works in a very general way that you you can actually change the number of engines that you're using, right? So what uh. So in my code, actually from the IPython parallel client, uh, there's a way to check how many engines there are. That, uh, so based on that, I split it evenly amongst the engines that I have. So if you have eight cores on your machine and you want to use all eight cores, then each engine would get an eighth of the database. And so uh, your code hopefully is written in a relatively general way that can change as the number of engines are changing. And that's something that you would want to do in general. But uh, in this homework assignment, I don't expect you to do that. So if you've hard-coded four engines into your code, you know, that's acceptable. But in a company setting, you want to write it in a flexible format so that it changes with the number of engines. Um, and another question is that uh, for the apply log function, you mentioned that uh, you, uh, we can use the apply uh, Apply, yeah. But if uh, I send the same function to for engine, uh, I can use the execute, right? Uh, yeah. So execute is different than apply uh, in the sense that uh, for execute you have to pass in the string uh, yeah. that you're that you're going to execute, right? 
whereas apply I'm passing in a function and that function gets executed. So they're a little bit different. Uh, and also for execute, uh, there's a question of how you're going to pull the result back from the engine. So. Uh, So if yeah, if it if it works for you and then you're doing a pull or something, yeah, that that would also work. Uh, I think applies a little bit cleaner because there's only a single call, like there's not a execute and then a pull. Uh, but uh, what you're doing, I think, is gonna functionally do the same thing. Uh, other questions? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> On the parallelization again. Um, so in class, you showed us how to use the math function. Yeah. And I understand how that works. Um, my, I guess my question is, can you do a similar thing using the apply function? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then there, so I, I guess I just haven't been able to figure that out. But so, for, like, in the case where you're down in S-Strat and yeah. you call the apply loss function yeah. with uh, F-name, and then, I mean, you want to, I'm trying to do use one line to... So it, it's not one line, it's a for loop. So what I do is I for do it on every yeah that's right I do a for loop over the engines yeah. I call apply on each engine and that apply call returns an asynchronous result object yep. and then under that for loop is another for loop that then collects the results from all the engines. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And th that's because we want to sort of set, send a specific thing to uh, each engine. With map, it might not be clear like which engine is getting which thing. Uh, okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah. So say again, you're trying to use the optimized W's from the k-means. I mean, yeah, bec uh, that's what I expect, right? Because the optimized W's for k-means are going to be totally different than the optimized W's for uh, multinomial, right? So if I use the optimal W's for k-means, in the multinomial classifier, I should be getting terrible like error rates. What kind of error rates were you getting? Uh, I got only around 60 correct oh, oh, Okay, so yeah, I'm very happy about that. So like 15 classifications out of 10,000, you know, like terrible error rates. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay, if not, uh, based on your questions, you guys are getting like a really deep understanding of what's going on here. So um, uh, good job, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the code that you wrote. Uh, and then on Tuesday, we're going to go over my code, and we can compare. Uh, and uh, you guys can tell me sort of similarities or differences that you executed. Okay, so I'd like to spend a little bit of time introducing your next homework assignment. Because uh, also based on your questions, it seems like many of you are very, very close to completing this one. So uh, one of the key differences in the remaining two assignments is that I'm not going to give you code structure anymore. So, uh, so far I've been giving you code structure which helps a little bit in organizing your thoughts and breaking down a big problem into little problems. From here on, basically I'm just going to say what needs to be done and it's up to you guys to organize your code into meaningful classes, meaningful objects and functions to actually get that done. So uh, for this homework, what we're going to do is basically implement uh, a GPS routing uh, software, right? So you can think of it like Google Maps or you can think of it like a little TomTom -tom or something like that. So uh, what you're going to learn about is uh, working with network data and network data structures uh, call, you're going to do some PyOMO, so you're going to call a solver within Python, and you're going to do some processing of uh, string data, and you're going to plot complex geographic results. So we did some geographic plotting at the beginning uh, where we just plotted uh, countries, but here we're going to actually plot maps and routes on those maps and so forth. 
Okay, so uh, just to get us started, I downloaded the actual, so like if you go to the uh, Austin City website, there you can get shape files for all the Austin streets. Okay, so that's going to be your data set uh, for this assignment. So let's just take a look at it briefly. So I downloaded it as a shape file, but I passed it through um, a little script that I wrote, and I could post that script online that changes it into a CSV file. So the only difference here is that, remember, for a shape file, we have uh, sort of the geometry, and then next to it, we have a bunch of data associated with the geometry. So uh, all of these columns here are all the data associated with the geometry, and the last column is the geometry itself. So I've translated it from whatever binary format is in the shape file into a string that you can put into the CSV file. And in particular, uh, the uh, common way of representing a geometry as a string is uh, what's called WKT. So let's just look up WKT uh, briefly online so you guys can get an idea of what that looks like. So it stands for well-known text. And uh, here's just some examples of the string that corresponds to a particular geometry. So a point would just be an x and a y value uh, with little parentheses around it. A uh, line string, which is uh, a line like this, would be uh, a sequence of points. And it tells you, you know, start at this point and then go to that point. Uh, polygons uh, might look like this or like this, and so forth, okay? Multi-points, multi-line strings, uh, and so forth. So let's just take a look at what kind of geometries were inside of the shape file that I downloaded uh, from Austin City. And if you look at them, they're basically all line strings. So uh, this is one geometry for the, first, uh, for the first shape in the shape file. Here's another line string for the second geometry, another line string for the third geometry. And what these are is basically little street segments, okay? Uh, and if they're street segments, can somebody give me an idea why I don't, these line strings have multiple points in them. Why isn't it just two points? That's right, they curve, right? So the shape file includes like the actual map information, which is how the street is curving from one point to another, okay? But if two streets or two line segments are intersecting with each other, what's gonna happen is uh, the coordinates at the beginning or at the intersection are going to match, right? So that's what's going to tell me that I can move from one street to another. And a lot of the other uh, sort of data here are things like the street name, the street type, but uh, interesting other things are, for example, whether it's one way, right? And since we're going to be implementing a Google Maps-like thing, we want to take the one-wayness of the streets into account to make sure that we don't send somebody uh, down the wrong way, okay? So those are some of the things that um, you're going to have to pay attention to uh, during this uh, project. So one other thing I want to show you about um, these CSV files with geometries in them is that uh, there's nice ways to visualize them in QGIS. So if you recall, when we were talking about visualizing geographic data at the beginning of class, uh, we did uh, the geoplotter, which you're going to use again, for this assignment, but I also told you that if you wanted to plot things uh, in a very complicated way, uh, but uh, without a program, without writing a program, you might uh, use QGIS to do it. So uh, let's just, uh, so we can add that CSV file as a layer here by going to layer, add layer, and add delimited layer. Uh, and then I'm just going to navigate to the file that we have.
Okay, so I uh, loaded uh, in that file, I got a layer name, and the important bit here is uh, the geometry field. So that's going to tell QGIS which column in the CSV file it should actually use to uh, pull out the geometry string. So it automatically detected that the geometry field I had was uh, called KML geometry. And uh, geometry type, I could say line, right? Because I know that there are lines in my particular case. Or I could say detect. So let's just uh, keep it at detect and see if QGIS uh, sort of correctly does things. Uh, so the next thing it might ask you is the coordinate reference system. So uh, what's going on here, it says, it's, it's asking how to interpret those particular coordinates. And for us, they're lat longs, OK? Uh, that's the way that I wrote out the file. And uh, by saying WGS84, you're basically saying that uh, your coordinates are lat long. Okay, and so that is going to give us the Austin map that you guys are going to be computing the routes on uh, for your uh, assignment. Uh, so let's go back and take a look at uh, what kinds of things you have to do for this map. So. Uh, the first thing you have to do is going to create a class that takes the input, all this street data, and creates a network data structure for the city, right? So this, uh, you're going to use network X here to actually create all the nodes, create all the edges uh, from the CSV file. So each street should be an end, uh, should be an edge, and ends of streets specified by lat long uh, location should be nodes, etc. And here's some information about the one wayness of the street. So what kind of a network is this going to be? Directed. And it's important that it's directed because we want to differentiate the way or the direction in which we're moving across an edge. Um, so you're going to use this class to find routes from one address to another. So uh, I, I'm going to give you a second uh, CSV file called addresses.csv. So let's take a look at that one quickly. So if you look at addresses.csv, all it has is a latitude or longitude and then uh, the name of that address. And I looked up some Austin restaurants. Um, so we're going to be routing to and from these locations. So we're going to use to find routes from one address in addresses.csv to, uh, to another. Uh, and to do this, you have to do the following. So given a lat long pair, so something that you read from addresses, you have to find the closest node to that point, right? Because the lat long pair in addresses doesn't necessarily match up to some node in the network, right? It could be a little bit off or something like that. So I have to find the closest node uh, in the network. And then uh, given that start node and end node, we're going to need to produce the shortest path in terms of driving time uh, between the nodes. Uh, so, uh, and you're going to implement this in two ways. So one is you're going to use network X and Dijkstra shortest path to compute the shortest path between the nodes. And the second way that you're going to do it is uh, using a linear program. So uh, using a shortest path linear program like the one that we described in class. But of course, the one that we did in class was for a network with like five nodes. This one's going to be for a network of 100,000 nodes or how many of our nodes are uh, in Austin. Okay. And then uh, at the end, you're just going to visualize and solve for some shortest paths. So these visualizations, uh, you're going to produce using uh, GeoPlotter. Okay? So this is a fun functionality of GeoPlotter that we didn't talk about before, but it's in there. So uh, for this part, you have to read the GeoPlotter code and basically figure out how to use that uh, to produce the maps. And then uh, here's some various routes that you're going to plot uh, moving from one place to another. So as you can see, because of the one-way uh, thing that we implemented, the kinds of routes that you get actually involve you know, taking off-ramps off of highways, turning around, and getting to your particular location. Uh, and so those are the kinds of qualities that your routes are going to have. So uh, just a couple of other things, uh, or just one other thing that uh, I think is going to help you uh, do this homework assignment. It's just a small functionality in Pandas that uh, I think is going to make your code a lot more efficient. So let me just start uh, IPython here.
So I'm going to read in the entire Austin CSV with all the various Rhone segments. And uh, so KML geometry is all those line strings for each one of the uh, for each one of the streets. So one of the things that I need to do to create my network X object is figure out the first coordinate of this line string and the last coordinate of this line string. Okay. So any ideas about how you would do that? So su suppose that we hadn't had this discussion and you just had to do this homework assignment. How would you figure out the first coordinate of this line string and the last coordinate of this line string? So I need to figure out, so this is the first coordinate of this, li this line string, and then the last coordinate is like somewhere way down there, right? But there's many coordinates in between because it's describing the entire curve of the street. So how do I just pull out the first coordinate of the line string? <coughs> Say again? Uh, so that's actually not an unreasonable idea. So his idea is that these have the exact same length, and because they have the same length, I could pull out uh, you know, a particular slice, and that's going to give me the first coordinate. But what about the last coordinate? Uh, so that's also not unreasonable. So your idea is to split on commas and take the first and last. Yeah, regular expression is the thing that I was looking for. Okay. Uh, so regular expressions is something that we talked about uh, a little bit in class earlier. It's a fantastic way to pull data out of strings. Okay. And pandas has a bunch of functionality in it to help you run regular expressions on columns. So let's try to do that. So, so if you look at this KML geometry column and then you do dot string, it gives you a bunch of functionality that's associated with strings. And in particular, uh, you know, here are the various splits that you guys told me about. But uh, one of the uh, things in here is uh, extract, okay? So let's just read extract. Uh, and it says, for uh, each uh, string in the series, extract groups from the first match of a regular expression pattern. So I uh, pass in a pattern, and it's going to extract that first match. right? So help me just write down uh, the regular expression pattern. So let me print the column again here. And help me write down the regular expression pattern that's going to just get the first coordinate. Uh, so, f so if I did float, float, comma, what, what does that regular expression look for? It actually looks for the word float, right? Because regular expression patterns think of everything as characters. They don't think of data types or anything like that. So how about line string space parenthesis, right? I know it has to be at the first one, so it's going to start with line string space and then a parenthesis. Uh, and then in here, I have to somehow say any digit, period, <laughs> uh, negative sign uh, is going to be the first thing, then maybe a space, uh, digit, period, negative sign, uh, and then a comma, right? And that's where I want to stop, is at the comma. So uh, any guesses on how to write that? Okay, so the way to specify groups of characters in uh, regular expressions is with these brackets. So when I do 0 through 9, it's basically saying any digit, 0 through 9. Um, we have to look minus. Yep. Uh, I think that if I do minus and period here, it's going to also do minus and period. Uh, and I want to say star or uh, something like that, to say as many of those as you want. Then a space, then another one of these. 
And uh, highly likely this is not going to work, right? So often I have to debug my regular expressions. Uh, so let's see uh, what this does. Okay, unbalanced parentheses. So one of the reasons that I'm getting unbalanced parentheses is if you recall, uh, when we extract things from regular expressions, what the, regu the way that you say what to extract is by surrounding it in a parenthesis, right? So that's how we extracted things before. So uh, here I want to say the actual parentheses character as opposed to ex start extracting. And so the way that you say the actual parentheses character is just with backslash parentheses, okay? Uh, and the thing that I want to extract is these two hopefully numbers that, uh, that are between there. So let's see what this does. Okay. So this seemed to uh, work reasonably well. Uh, so should we go over what this is saying again? So it says line string, space, parenthesis character, start extracting, right? So that's what this parenthesis does. Here, take any digit, 0 through 9, any minus sign, and any period, repeat it as many times as you want. Then a single space, then again, any digit 0 through 9, any minus sign, any period, repeat it as many times as you want, stop extracting, and then the next character should be a comma, okay? Uh, and that's why it's taking this whole 30, right? Uh, because uh, the next character has to be a comma for this thing to match. Does that make sense? Uh, in the grouping, uh, how does uh, the x differentiate between the first and the like, Why doesn't it consider 0 to 9 as the subtraction symbol? Uh, so, uh, so why is this dash different than this dash? Yeah. It's just the way that uh, these character sets are defined. So for character sets, uh, I think the only time that you can do dash is uh, here. And this was also me guessing, right? It's possible that I somehow did it incorrectly, in which case I would have looked up online how to do this and somebody would have told me, okay? Uh, but it seemed to work reasonably okay here, uh, in particular because we caught this minus sign. So uh, I know that at least it's matching minuses. So now that we can capture the first coordinate in this line string, can you help me edit this regular expression so that I capture the last coordinate? So now all the line strings have different lengths, right? So different streets are going to have different lengths. But how do I capture the last coordinate of the line string? Can you show us one more line? Before? Yeah. Uh, so let's take a look at KML geometry 0. Oh, let's look at the 10th one. or the third one. Yeah, so there's some different lengths. Uh, yeah, so at the end, there's just going to be a parenthesis, right? You could group the things we have captured with an asterisk so that it can be repeated as many times and then we can have it at the end a single thing. Right, but I want to only capture the last one. Yeah, so, I'm, uh, so whatever you have written, like uh, the things within those parentheses that we are capturing, you uh, nest, uh, you group group it in using the square bracket, and then uh, comma, and then again the repetition of this. There's an easier way to do that. Uh, so what you're saying might work. I think that if you debug it enough, it will work. But does somebody else have a different suggestion? How about you put the closing parenthesis? Okay, so you want to put the uh, here instead of this comma, you want to put a closing parenthesis. What about uh, up here? Yeah, let's try getting rid of all of it, right? Okay, Look like, uh, looks like it reasonably worked, right? So let's just double check by looking at the last uh, KML geometry here to see if we actually got uh, the last one. So the last thing was uh, this, and uh, it looks like that's what we pulled out, right? So uh, it looks like that worked just fine, OK? So uh, I suggest doing something like this to define your nodes of your network and uh, your edges from there on. Does that make sense? OK.
so that's everything I wanted to say about homework five. Let's, uh, unless there's any questions uh, about anything uh, related to that, let's go back and finish our facility location uh, program. So let's just recall where we were uh, and what our uh, formulation looked like. So we had sets of nodes and arcs. We had these y variables that decided, do I uh, open a store at location i? We had these x, i, j variables that uh, say whether a customer at location j is going to go to a store at location i. Uh, and we had an objective function that looked like this. It had an opening cost component that was the uh, amount of money that was required to open a store at location i times whether we open it or not. And then the distance that customer from J travels to location I if they actually do that traveling, okay? Uh, and we had just gotten to uh, just writing that objective, so let's see what the code that we created looks like. So here we read in our two uh, CSV files, so one had opening costs and the other had distances. We computed our uh, sets. Uh, we changed the index of the opening location uh, so that we could easily access the various opening costs. Here we used uh, all pair shortest path to compute the distances between each pair of locations. So we needed that for the objective function uh, to compute the DIJs ahead of time. And uh, finally, we just got to uh, writing the Pioma model. So here we uh, create the model uh, object. We add the sets that were initialized by the facility set and the customer set. We created the y variables and the x variables. And we just got to this point, which was uh, creating the objective rule, right? But we have not yet added this objective rule to the Pyomo object. So one step that I often do, and it's the last thing that we did in class last time, uh, was I just quickly check whether this function that I've written is actually doing the kinds of it creating the kinds of expressions that you expect for it to create, right? So what I expect this to create is y times opening costs plus x times these distances. Uh, so let's just go over that one more time to remind ourselves how to uh, print that. So if I run here uh, facility location, I can call this objective rule function and pass uh, into it the model object. So I'm passing in this object which we created. And that returns a Pyomo sum expression. And I wanted to uh, print that. And I uh, went through various ways of trying to do that, but print seems like uh, it works just fine, right? So uh, to print that expression, I just print uh, the expression. And here's uh, the y's times the various opening costs and the x's times the various distances. And for debugging purposes, I might, uh, for a small example, kind of write it out with pencil and paper and make sure that this matches, OK? But it looks like it's matching. And so how do I add this to the actual Pyomo model object at this point? So I can call it anything I want, right? So I'm just going to call it capital OBJ, but I could have called it lowercase. Let's just change things. Let's call it lowercase objective. And that's going to be a Pyomo objective type object, right? Its rule is going to be uh, this rule that we created. And the last thing is the sense, which is do I want to be maximizing this objective or do I want to minimize this objective? So uh, here, we want to minimize. So if I, run, uh, if I run our code again and do uh, m.pprint, it's going to print out all of the pieces of the model that we've created so far. So we've created these uh, set declarations, which is uh, the customer set and the facility set. Uh, we've created these x's which are uh, indexed by a cross product of things. We've created these y's uh, that are indexed by the facility set. And then uh, this is our objective whose sense is minimize. It's active, and that's the expression for it. OK. So uh, the next thing that we need to do 
is uh, write our first uh, constraint. So what did this constraint say in English? So th that's what the math of it looks like, but what does it actually mean? Yeah, every customer should go to uh, one location, exactly one location, right? So, uh, so help me write that. So first of all, how many of these constraints are there? Yeah, there's one of these constraints for every customer. And so here, uh, let's say, let's call it the customer rule. So the first thing that it always gets is the model, but what's the second thing that this constraint is going to take as a parameter? It's going to take a customer, right? So we could call it a J. So yeah, maybe we call it a J just to kind of match up with what we've written. But oftentimes I don't, like sometimes that's confusing to me, so you might call it customer just to kind of keep it more clear in your mind, right? Uh, okay, so uh, what do I need to return here? Yeah, so I'm gonna sum uh, the x's and let's recall how we index the x's. So uh, the x's are right there and its first index is gonna be a customer and the second index is gonna be a facility, right? So what's the first index here? Is the, gonna be the particular customer for which I'm creating the constraint, right? And the second index is gonna be some facility. And I'm gonna iterate for facilities in where? Yep. Uh, w yeah, M dot facility set. Right, so that should create the, the first sum, but this is a constraint. So what I need to do uh, to finish it? Uh, it's the right-hand side, right? So it's an equality constraint, so that's why I did a double equals, and then the right-hand side is one. So let's uh, run everything again. And let's, the same way that I tested the objective function, let's test this constraint to see if I wrote just this rule function correctly. So I'm gonna, uh, so it's called uh, customer rule. So maybe I didn't save it. Let me uh, save it first. Yeah, so customer rule. I'm gonna pass in the model. And then the second thing that I need to pass in is a customer, right? So what represents a customer uh, in, in our little example right now? It's like a string, right? So uh, it's those strings that are N1, N2, and so forth. And in particular, the way that you could check that is, uh, it's one of these strings, right? So let's try to print uh, customer rule passing in M and let's say N2. Okay, so that's the constraint that my function is gonna create for N2 which is N2 going to N1, N2 going to N2, N2 going to N3, N2 going to N4, and N5 has to all equal one. All right, so uh, at least visually for this small example, uh, it makes sense. Okay, so help me now add this constraint onto the model object. So what do I do? Okay, so it's gonna be a customer constraint. And then P dot constraint, okay. So the first part here is gonna tell Pyomo what to iterate over and pass into the second parameter here. So what should I write there? Yeah, so uh, here it's M dot customer set. So this is saying that I'm gonna have one of these constraints for every customer in the customer set. Uh, and then the second bit is what rule we're gonna use and we're gonna use this customer rule. So let's uh, run everything and uh, do pprint on M. And so now we get uh, one constraint declarations which we didn't have before, which uh, is indexed by the customer. The lower and the upper bounds for this constraint is the same. 
so that's because it's an equality constraint, right? So the expression in between has to exactly equal to that lower and upper bound. And uh, the sum, so the sum of the various x's have to equal one. So looks pretty good so far. Okay, so let's do uh, the last couple uh, of things here. So one is this facility budget, right? So uh, here we have the sum of the y's has to equal two, right? So there's only one of those constraints. So help me write that. So what does this budget rule take as a input? Yeah, just the model, because there's not going to be many of them. Okay, so on the one hand, I'm tempted to write something like this. The sum of uh, the facilities equals two, but what's, what's wrong with that? I mean, the only thing that's wrong with that is that I'm making like code that's very, very difficult to reuse, right? So suppose that I want to solve this again with like placing one facility instead of two facilities or three facilities instead of two facilities, right? I have to like dig through my code to see everywhere where I hard coded two uh, and change that to something else, right? So there's a much better way to do it. And uh, maybe we do it uh, up here. So maybe we'd say budget is two. And let's say here we say equals budget. And there's various ways to do this. And one of the things that we're going to do after we get this running is we're going to change it all into a class so that we can reuse this code many times for lots of different data sets uh, in a nice way. But uh, OK, so let's add this budget constraint, which is p.constraint. But now, because I'm not going to be looping over any set to create this constraint, I just do rule equals uh, the budget rule, OK? And let's uh, run and debug again. Uh, so pretty print. So here's the budget constraint that didn't appear before. And it's saying that the sum of the y's has to equal 2 for the lower and upper bound. So that's what we wanted, OK? OK, so uh, help me write the last one. So this one, uh, what did this constraint actually mean? That's right. That customer J can only go to facility I if the facility is open. OK, so uh, let's write the rule for that. So let's call it something like facility open rule. So it takes M. And then what else does it take? So it definitely takes a customer, but it also takes a facility, right? So this constraint actually is going to take two parameters into it. And the way that we know, we know that from the write-up is that this is for all J and for all I, right? So I'm going to have to loop over customers and loop over facilities for this constraint. OK, so here I need to return m.x for this customer and facility is less than or equal to uh, m.y for this facility, right? So this uh, seems correct. OK, so help me finish the rest of the part here. So what's, what should I pass in for the first parameter of p dot constraint. So m dot customer set, but that's not quite enough. Right, because I want to iterate over the cross product of customers and facilities, right? Yeah, so it's the customer set times, which gets interpreted as set cross product, times m dot facility set. 
and then the rule is going to be our facility uh, open rule. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, so the, the key part here is this had two parameters. I need to call this rule with every combination of customer and facility. And this is going to create every combination of customer and facility. Okay. Okay, and so here we're getting uh, all of those facility open constraints. So uh, their key is, or the thing that identifies a single one of those is a customer and then a facility, right? So customer one can only go to location one if location one is open. So let's read this a little bit. So the lower bound is minus infinity and the upper bound is zero. So why is that? Because dx is less than or equal to the y, and so if you move the y over to the other side, it looks exactly like what we wrote. But the lower and upper bounds have to be constants, uh, because that's the way that solvers just take things uh, as input. Okay? But it looks like we've created this uh, correctly. And so the last, so it looks like we've uh, coded everything nicely. Uh, let's just quickly change the budget to one. And the reason I want to change the budget to one is uh, so that we can uh, just debug things, okay? Uh, and the reason is that this is our graph. And uh, if we had only one facility to open, where would you open it? Which is N1, okay? So all these distances are 10, right? With one facility, I should put it here because then uh, you know everybody's going to walk either zero or distance ten. So hopefully, when we look at the solution, we just get that n that the y for n one is equal to one, and all the other y's are uh, equal to zero. Okay. All right. So now uh, that we have this model, we have to solve it. Okay. So. Uh, I often have to cut paste these solver lines because I just don't remember them off the top of my head. So this is the solver lines from our uh, shortest path example. So it, they look like create a solver object by doing Pyomo op solver factory uh, passing in Cplex and then uh, actually calling solve uh, with maybe some uh, option string. So I'm just going to cut paste these into our code here. Okay, and uh, of course, instead of solving self.m, here I'm just going to solve m, because that's our model object. And uh, let's try to run this and see what happens. Okay, so, uh, you know, some good... Uh, some good results is uh, that we're getting an integer optimal solution. So uh, it's telling us that the objective is 90, uh, and we can read some other things from Cplex. Uh, so reading this output is oftentimes informative and can help you identify bugs. So we have uh, 31 variables. Uh, we have uh, some objective functions. Um, uh, some linear constraints and so forth, okay? So let's print the model to see uh, what kind of solution we got. And in particular, uh, the solution that we're going to get is from the x's and from the y's. So let's take a look at the y's. Uh, so it looks like the only facility that we opened was facility 1, which is good, right? Uh, and let's take a look at the x's to make sure that those are behaving properly. So what do I expect from the x's? That every customer should be walking to facility one, right? So uh, customer one is walking to facility one. C 
Customer two is walking to facility one. Customer three is walking to facility one. Four is walking to one, and so forth, right? And some other debugging steps you could do is actually uh, sort of write out by hand to see if the objective actually is 90. So let's see what Pyomo thinks the objective is. So the way to do that is to just call m.objective and it thinks that it's 90, okay? So uh, we can go with pencil and paper and see if this value in our data set actually produces the 90. So this looks reasonable, yeah, question. Yeah, it's using the objective rule and it's using the values of the, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see if, uh, I'm just kind of curious. If we had two facilities, is it possible to just do it by observation what the solution should be? Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. So the way that I would debug it is I would create an example where it's obvious where the two facilities should go and then test my program with that new example, okay? So let's quickly take our code that right now it's not in a particularly nice format because it's all in the script. It's not in a class that I can reuse somehow. And let's just make it nicer so that other code that we write can easily reuse it, okay? So uh, we're going to define a facility location class. And uh, what do you think that this class should take as input? Yeah, just the two CSV files. That's all we need to do this, right? So uh, distances file and uh, costs or, oh, yeah, cost file. And uh, at the same time as I'm developing my class, here I want to do uh, if uh, name is main. I want to keep the uh, individual data that we're calling it with. So uh, down here, we're going to pass in uh, distances.csv and um, opencost.csv. Okay, so in this init function, we're basically going to do things like this, right? So it's all this pre-processing before we actually maybe create the model, okay? So what's, what's another thing that, you, that maybe my facility location should take as input besides distances and the opening costs? The budget. The budget, right? Okay, so now we can uh, change this, uh, that we wrote uh, sort of as a standalone script into our class by saying things like just self is going to hold this data frame. This is going to be the distances file. This is going to be the uh, open cost file. Okay, so some things I'm putting onto the self object, but other things I'm not going to. So uh, in this next bit, like which is the part I should put onto self and which is the part I probably shouldn't? Right, so I put the, uh, the, this CSV file onto self, I put in that CSV file onto self, the sets I put onto self, but in here, like, what should I put onto self and what shouldn't I? Image. 
So I I would personally probably not put the network graph on there. So why is that? It's because I don't use it anywhere other than right here, right? Like the only thing I use elsewhere is the distances. And even this entire code I might put into its own function. That's like com compute pairwise distances or something like that, right? So um, let's do that. Where? Uh, here. Um, okay, so let's save the budget. And then let's here call self dot uh, compute pairwise distances. Okay, so hopefully uh, at the end of computing the pairwise distances, uh, self is going to have this distances object that has everything uh, in it for the pairwise distances. And then we're going to maybe create model. And what's going to go inside of create model is all of this uh, computation that we had. and. Uh, Typically, probably a, an interesting thing to do, or something that I sometimes do, is split the model creation and the model solution, right? Uh, because outside code might want to call it separately, right? Sort of set it up first and then solve it. Uh, so for model creation, uh, all of this looks roughly the same, except these facility sets now are on self. Uh, all of this is going to look exactly the same, except these open CDF costs are on self. These distances are on self. Uh, this looks exactly the same. The budget is now going to be on self. And the last thing I want to do is actually put the model onto self, right? So, so far I was just kind of creating a model object and at the end I want to put it on the facility location object. And then the final thing is uh, solve. Which is just going to have these two things uh, and instead of passing in M, I'm going to pass in self.m. So uh, so I call create model from init, but I have to call solve outside of that. And so now we've created uh, a class out of uh, the code that previously wasn't a class. So let's run this. And uh, now I can look at fc.m. Uh, and uh, it's it's giving me sort of the same nice results. Okay. So uh, the nice thing now is that if you have some other code that needs to solve facility location, the only thing that the other code needs to do is create these two CSV files, pass in a budget, and import this facility location object, right? Uh, and your other code no longer has to know anything about the way that facility location models work. They just have to know about what what the variables mean and so forth. Um, so I'd like to change this a little bit. Uh, in particular, right now, in every location, we have just one customer. Okay. So suppose I want to change this so that 
let's say five people live in N3 uh, and one person lives in all of the other ones. Or maybe like a thousand people live in N3 and only one person lives in all of the other ones. If that was the case and I had one facility to put, where would I put it? it I should put it in N3, right? Because uh, it's going to be closer to most of my customers. So help me change both the uh, CSV files and the formulation to include the number of customers that are at each location. So how am I going to do that? So, uh, so some of you are thinking on how to, uh, how to change the formulation. So let's just help me change the formulation. So suppose that I had something like NJ, let's say that NJ is the number of customers on location J. Right, so how do I change the formulation uh, now that I have this new piece of data? Yeah, so I'm going to want uh, an NJ here. And the reason is because all of the customers in that location, they're all going to walk to the same place. Okay? Okay, so where should I put that in terms of the data, though? So certainly in the program, I know where to put it. I'm going to put in the objective rule. But my facility location object has to get those NJs from somewhere. So where should it get them from? So right now it has these two files coming in. That's the distances file and the open cost file. But I don't, I don't have a number of customers yet. That's kind of my question, is I want to put in that piece of data somewhere. So where should I put it? Like the, my facility lo location class has to read in the number of customers for it, every node. So uh, what's a convenient location to put that? Yeah, so I could put it here, or I could put in an, an entirely new CSV file if I wanted to keep the set of facilities separate from the set of customers, okay? But let's say that in our particular uh, way that we're doing it, uh, the, set of the set of facility locations and the set of customer locations is the same. So I'm just going to put it on uh, open costs. So I'm going to have just a new column here that's the number of customers. And now uh, node 3 is going to have 1,000 customers on it, but all the other nodes are just going to have uh, one customer on it. And maybe instead of uh, open costs, uh, we can now call this something like node data.csv because it's more uh, it's more a sort of data associated with each node, right? W whether it's opening costs or the number of customers. Okay, so now everything looks almost exactly the same. We have these uh, open CDF that got read in. And uh, you were saying that I need to edit the objective function. So what do I do here? So, so what do I do there? I mean, this is the place I need to add it, right? Because like, this is the DJI, and I need to multiply it by the NJ. So the only question is, how do I actually access that piece of information, right? So that piece of information is in this data frame, like the op what we used to call the open data frame, right? And I might go through and change the name of this. 
but this is the way that I refer to the cost column of that data frame. So now I need to refer to the end customers column of that data frame. So what do I write there? Yeah. Okay. But now what? J. Okay, so why J? Because here I'm iterating for J and customer set and for I and facility set. And I want the uh, the number of customers on location J and not location I, right? Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, so file open cost doesn't exist. That's because I changed it to node data. So let me change that. Okay, so now if I do, uh, if I print the Ys, uh, so I'm getting an error here, right? It looks like an error. So first, my objective function value definitely changed. Uh, but uh, yeah, my Ys, I expected the facility to be put in N3, but it got put in N1. So how might I go about debugging this? So the only thing I change is the objective, right? So I need to make sure that this objective is actually matching up with what I want it to be saying, right? So So this is the objective expression. Uh So uh maybe the reason is that uh these costs are uh, a thousand, right? So uh that's kind of balancing out against the thousand customers that I put uh, in N3. But if I make uh, N3, let's make it something different. So instead of saying a thousand customers, let's say it's 10,000 customers, right? Okay, so still getting an error. Oh. Okay, I know what my error is. Uh, the reason is that I'm looking at m dot y. Okay, this is an old object that's left over from when we before we changed this to a class. It's like when I was running that file uh, as a standalone file, right? What I should be looking at is fc.m.y, right? Because that's where my actual new model object is with the new uh, objective function uh, and so forth. And if we had carefully looked at that expression, we would have noticed that the distance times the nj wasn't there, OK? Uh, but this is now looking correct. Right? We actually put the facility uh, at N3. And so uh, this is a good reason why uh, sometimes it's useful to just kind of restart IPython. So if I restart IPython and I run the facility location example and I try to do this, it's going to give me an error, right? Because that old object is no longer going to be there. Uh, only the new object that got created from my last run uh, is going to be there, right? So uh, that's uh, that one. Okay, so this is pretty much uh, uh, this is a great time to end for today. Uh, next time we're going to pick up by discussion of homework four and by implementing a uh, minimum spanning tree, which is a significantly different uh, integer program. So thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you all next week.